The last time I used a MacBook Pro as my primary computer, I absolutely hated the experience. The butterfly keyboard broke multiple times and offered a generally terrible typing experience. The touch bar was more annoying than useful, particularly when it froze and prevented me from easily adjusting the screen brightness, volume, or even hitting the escape key. But the real reason I hated the computer was its lackluster performance. The Mac simply overheated on a regular basis. I took it to Apple three times, and their geniuses claimed everything was working as expected, which may well have been the truth. But every time I worked on a massive Photoshop file or edited a video, the rear of the machine would grow so hot that it would turn itself off and refuse to reboot for an hour or more. This happened despite the fans sounding like they were spinning up for takeoff. I even demonstrated this behavior in front of Apple, and they basically told me not to push the computer so hard. In other words, you're holding the phone wrong. As it turned out, this was the infamous Intel i9 processor that didn't belong in a MacBook, particularly in an era in which Apple seemed to value the thinness of its professional products more than their ability to dissipate heat. Of course, my computer eventually broke from repeatedly overheating, and Apple was kind enough to replace the cooked logic board for free, something they did one more time the next time the computer fried itself to death. When the M1 chips came out, I purchased a Mac Mini because I'd heard how amazing the new processors were. Unfortunately, I bought into the hype that you didn't need that much RAM because the integrated chips were so good at using SSD for swap that the RAM had become almost irrelevant. And this is a myth propagated even by some of today's hardware reviewers, and let me tell you, it's false. If you're working among several professional applications like Premiere, Photoshop, and Illustrator, you need more RAM, eight or even 16 gigabytes, disappears at once, and it takes the computer several seconds for it to catch up when clicking between applications. Even if things were faster, you still probably shouldn't be using your SSD as random access memory since that'll prematurely ruin your storage. Anyway, I grew so annoyed that I sold the Mini and plunked down $3,000 plus on a 27-inch Intel iMac. I installed 64 gigabytes of RAM from a third-party seller, and I was off to the races. Everything was immediately faster than either the M1 Mini or the i9 MacBook Pro. Plus, I loved the nanotexture, anti-glare etching on the screen, since glossy displays in which I have to look past my own reflection is a big pet peeve. I've been using the iMac happily ever since. Actually, I still love the computer. Uh, the only issue is that it doesn't move. It's stuck to my desk, and lately, I've been having to leave my desk a lot more. So I decided to sell the iMac and some other stuff and replace it with a near top-of-the-line MacBook Pro. And I'm hoping this video will be useful for anyone making the leap from an Intel Mac to an Apple Silicon Mac. Back when I tested the M1, aside from its RAM issue, there were a ton of application compatibility issues that made using it almost impossible. So how is the application ecosystem today? Did I run into any speed bumps? Is the M3 Max chip really 11 times faster than the last Intel processors, as Apple loves to claim? Let's find out. First, let's get some obvious facts out of the way. The newer MacBook Pro hardware design is superior to the touch bar model in almost every way. Above all, Apple is no longer prioritizing thinness over functionality. Perhaps we have Johnny Ive's departure to thank for that. And Apple's energy-efficient chips, combined with a greater thermal envelope in the larger chassis, have proven themselves capable of running at high clock speeds for extended periods without throttling. Where the Core i9 began throttling after five minutes of exporting a video, or less, the M3 Max doesn't noticeably slow down almost ever. The return to scissor switch keys is also welcome, as is the reappearance of the function keys. Key travel is acceptable, though a bit shallow for my taste, with the bottoming out of the keys a little too harsh. I type a lot, 
and after an hour of pecking at the keys, my fingertips become sore. And this isn't the case on my Lenovo machine, which I can use all day without fatigue. And the board does have a satisfying reverberation where it manages to both feel hollow while also being completely stable. I think the best way to explain it is that there's a sense of separation between the keyboard and the chassis, almost as if it's a standalone keyboard. And key spacing is pretty standard, and there's a very slight indentation in the keys, which I'd actually like to be a bit more pronounced. The spacebar is great no matter where you press it, an area some lesser boards usually get wrong. I'd say the MacBook Pro's keyboard is about as good as you can expect for this kind of laptop, though nowhere near as good as an older ThinkPad keyboard or most decent mechanical keyboards. And finally, I know some people loved the touch bar, but I never understood it and I'm glad it's gone. Since like most pro users, I memorize shortcuts in my frequently used apps, having contextual menus that change constantly and I have to look at to use never felt right. And you already know the trackpad is top of its class. It beats any Windows trackpad with so much room to spare that I'm constantly left wondering why Windows machines simply can't catch up in this area. Really, it's nuts. I've used a ton of Windows machines, and while they outshine their Mac counterparts in some notable areas like graphics performance, trackpads isn't one of them. Uh, the screen is as good as I would ever want, even compared to OLED laptops. You know, no matter how much I attempt to adjust the colors on an OLED screen, even using a spider, my images never quite look right. Uh, this LCD nails it out of the bag, so as long as you remember to turn off that true tone nonsense that changes the color temperature based on ambient lighting, you'll probably be satisfied as well. The notch is mildly annoying, but you can't have everything, I guess. The speakers are about as excellent as the screen. They have a surprising amount of bass while also nailing highs even at louder volumes. It's actually weird how good they are, almost to the point that I don't reach for my headphones every time I open Spotify for casual listening. A port selection is less great. While the Thunderbolt ports are good, this is where the comparison to my older iMac starts to get interesting. The thing is, to match the iMac in port variety, RAM, screen size, and storage, you need to spend a lot more. I use a bunch of ports. At any given time, I might need to plug in a mouse adapter, one or two SSDs, a storage drive, speakers, a USB microphone, a headphone interface, an extra monitor, an SD card, a CF Express card, an ethernet cable, a keyboard, and various devices to charge or sync. This far exceeds the capacity of the MacBook's Thunderbolt 4 ports, necessitating a dock. And good Thunderbolt docks are incredibly expensive. I wound up spending $400 on mine. Then there's the fact that the RAM is not user upgradable. I paid maybe 100 bucks for 64 gigabytes of third-party iMac RAM, while going from 32 to 64 gigabytes in this laptop cost $400. And I would have preferred 128 gigabytes, but I just can't justify the insane expense. Finally, the laptop needs a larger screen for serious desk work. And Apple's XDR display is prohibitively expensive. So after some poor experiences with LG's models, I opted for the disappointing and still overpriced studio display. It's pretty much the same screen from my old iMac, which is itself disappointing if only because it runs at just 60 Hertz, and doesn't have local dimming, something I'd expect at this price point. This means no HDR. The only positive I can say for the screen is that it doesn't have any of the connectivity issues that plague third-party options, many of which randomly won't turn back on when you wake up your computer from sleep. So to summarize, a comparable laptop setup to match my aging iMac was basically twice the cost. It's $4,500 for the laptop, then $2,000 for the screen and $400 for a Thunderbolt 4 hub. That's about $7,000, more than I've ever spent on a computer or really anything else short of a car. If the computer lasts seven years, I'd feel somewhat okay about it, I guess, but anything less than that, I'll be pretty bothered. 
And professional Macs really are overpriced these days. And despite their excellent combination of power and battery performance that is absent from PC competitors, there's no getting around the absurd cost. Apple charges pros because they'll pay. I'll pay. And it's really as simple as that. For folks like me who aren't as productive in the Microsoft ecosystem, Apple's got our wallets locked up. And the question then becomes, are Apple's M3 Silicon iMacs really that good? I fell for the M1 once and I was deeply let down. And has anything changed? I too read all the reviews, complete with benchmarks and specs, but those numbers don't tell the whole story. Professional users generally don't sit in an app performing the same task over and over. We often jump among multiple heavy apps, switching tasks and asking different feats of our computers throughout any given day. I myself work a lot in Adobe's overpriced suite, but I also dance around with other apps. I wanted to feel whether the friction I experienced with the M1 was still there. The short answer is no. The M3 Max and its surrounding components really are as good as the reviews suggest. I'm not a benchmarks guy, and since there's plenty of those floating around, feel free to look them up if they'll help. Overall, I just want to give you a sense of how fast the computer feels in a professional workflow with a few concrete examples. And I will say Photoshop is noticeably faster to open files. A 700 plus megabyte drawing took about eight seconds to open on the iMac and about two seconds on the MacBook Pro. And brush performance is better, though it's only noticeable when it comes to larger or more complex brushes with intricate textures. Uh, raw files open maybe twice as fast, though it's not really a big deal since it only took a couple of seconds on the iMac to begin with. I'm just happy that the performance feels snappy. And a few bugs I experienced on my iMac seem to be gone on the MacBook Pro. Maybe Adobe is paying more attention to Apple Silicon as the older Intel machines get left by the wayside. Premiere exports are about twice as fast, though your mileage will certainly vary depending upon the video formats you work with and your export settings. A 14 minute video took around 28 and a half minutes on the iMac versus 16 and a half on the MacBook Pro. Um, I don't work with 8K footage, but even my 4K footage sometimes would lag behind on my iMac when editing. Not so on the MacBook Pro. Playback is as smooth as you'd like, no matter how much I scrub around the timeline. I'm sure Final Cut would be even faster, but I don't enjoy the magnetic timeline and as many issues as I have with Adobe as a company, working within their ecosystem is sometimes easier. Then there's the slew of other applications I use, all of which now run exceptionally well on Apple Silicon. And this wasn't the case at all a couple of years ago when crashes were common across a wide variety of situations. I'm optimistic that this computer will be my main machine for years to come, hopefully until it breaks a decade from now, though I have a feeling that's being overly optimistic. At the very least, I don't think I'll return this machine and there's only a small handful of changes I feel would make the MacBook Pro even better. First, and perhaps most controversially, I really want a touchscreen on my Mac. Specifically, I want a stylus-enabled touchscreen like the iPads. As it is, I need to use a separate display to gain stylus support, something I find completely necessary in my workflow, but really adds yet another costly element to an already overpriced machine. And Windows manufacturers have solved this problem in a number of ways. You know, rotating displays, pivoting displays, detachable displays, secondary displays, the list goes on. On one hand, I appreciate Apple's dedication to what works. On the other, I really want the option to swap in a touchscreen. You know, go ahead and make it an overpriced component. I'm already paying Wacom a couple grand. I'd rather the functionality be built in. Really, the iPad can stand on its own, even if the Mac gained a touchscreen. The app ecosystem and user flows on the iPad are different enough that there would still be enough separation on an already narrowing category. Second, while the dark finish on the MacBook Pro is nice, I can't say I agree with other reviewers who claim the finish doesn't pick up fingerprints. 
I mean, it does. It's not insane like some other black finishes, but it certainly is possible to create grease spots on the machine. Maybe the other reviewers just have really dry skin or perhaps mine is extra oily, but whatever the case, I spotted grease on the laptop's lid after just minutes of use, even after washing my hands. And third, I wish the keys had a bit more travel. I know some people love the MacBook keyboards, but compared to the typing experience on my ThinkPad, the MacBook sucks. It just doesn't feel as good to me. You know, low profile mechanical switches would be a dream, though I accept that's never gonna happen. So that's my experience transitioning from an i7 chip to an M3. Apple is certainly ahead of the curve, though not permanently so. Now I worry for a future in which Apple's competitors surpass the M line of processors. We'll be back in the IBM Power PC days, when Mac users had to watch in frustration as Windows users got more and more power each year while they languished on older technology. I hope this won't happen as there are obvious benefits to Apple's vertical integration that can outweigh some amount of theoretical future deficiency, which I hope will keep Apple competitive. Anyway, let me know if you have any questions, particularly if you're thinking of making the jump yourself. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you again soon.